scriptures tonight. Happy to see everybody here. We are going to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Doing the Beatitudes. All right. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall reserve, receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Our lesson this morning is going to be taken from Matthew chapter 5. It's only going to be one verse in that chapter. And sometimes when we read through scriptures, we can see where sometimes it's Jesus and other times it's one of the apostles give us a description of what we are. And that description is important or it should be important to us for a few reasons. Um, not only does it give us a designation, it gives us part of our identity it tells us more also about the purpose and the way that God views us. And so we understand the descriptions in the Bible. And I've been fascinated by these, some of which I've preached on in the past. But uh, when I found myself sick and was down uh, this last, well, it's been a week now, um, I was really just doing some personal study on this idea that I'm going to preach about this morning. And the more I looked into it, the more I decided, I want to share this. This is really good. It helped me, and I hope it's helpful to you. But the Lord gives us a couple designations here in Matthew 5. In verses 13 through 16, he gives us two. One, he says, you're the salt of the earth. And the other one, he says, you're the light of the world. And we'll just begin with these two. But this morning, we're only going to be looking at one the salt of the earth, which is in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. So Jesus tells us just that we are the salt of the earth. That's who you are. That's what Jesus says you are. You believe it? But what does it mean? What does it mean that we are the salt of the earth? And in studying this, you can see in ancient times, there was a lot of different uses for salt. It was a pretty big commodity, apparently. Uh, one of the uses for salt was they would add it into some of their sacrifices. And so when they would offer certain things, back in Leviticus, you can read about salt was a part of some of that. And it emphasized the strength of the covenant that they were in with God. You would read, if you read sources, that uh, salt was used as a preservative in the ancient world. They didn't have refrigeration, and so salt was used in order to preserve meats. Sometimes meats, when they were cut, would be wrapped with salt. Fish, when they were caught, would be wrapped in salt, and they would be then shipped, and they could be, you know, travel several days and then sell them in other markets because of the preservation quality. Salt would allow the meat to stay good. Uh, sometimes salt was used in wounds or as a medicine. They would wrap wounds with salt, and it was to help. Sometimes salt was used to purify things. And you read that salt was used as a seasoning agent, as we often use it today. And also, even Roman soldiers were sometimes paid, their wages were paid in salt. And I think that's where the term came from, he's worth his salt. Because salt was such a valuable commodity that you could just be paid with salt and you could sell that stuff and use that just about like money in those days. So salt is fascinating for that reason. There's a lot of good uses for it. But what is Jesus driving at here? And I'm not going to bore you with all of the things that I read about what people say it means. Why don't we just look at what Jesus says and then we can figure it out by looking at the text. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, here's what we read. You are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Notice what he says here. Most sources, most commentaries that I read were suggesting that it was just the idea of a preservative. But what does Jesus emphasize here? He says, if the salt becomes tasteless, other commentary, I mean, other translations will say, lost its taste. If salt loses its taste, others write, if it's lost its flavor. When do you know if salt has flavor or not? Not by wrapping meat. You don't know if salt has flavor unless you're putting it in your food. If I sit down at the table and I use my salt shaker on my food, I'm going to know right quick whether or not it has flavor or doesn't. And so he's talking about the flavor of the salt. He's talking about the seasoning quality of it. The same purpose that we often use it with today, isn't it? That's fascinating. So in all those uses, we can see what Jesus is talking about. And he says that we are salt. That's what we are. So if I could sum up everything that Jesus is talking about in this one verse with one word, the word I would use is influence. Influence is what Jesus is getting at here. You and I, as Christians, we are the influencers of the earth. And we are to be putting off a certain influence, namely that which was just read in the scripture, there the Beatitudes. We are to be uh, putting forth a, an influence in this world. Mark chapter 9 verse 50 is a parallel to what Jesus says here. And in that verse it says, salt is good, have this salt in yourselves. So instead of just calling us salt, it says we have to have salt in us. So we're like salt shakers, you know. As people in this world, we are the Christians, we are the salt shakers of the world. So when we interact with people in the world, we ought to basically be like pouring out an influence that has some favorable qualities that God wants us to have. And so people, when they come in contact with a Christian, it's very different than when they come in contact with just any other person. Well, there's two points I want to make from this text this morning. Number one is the designation of disciples and that Jesus gives us here. And number two is the danger uh, for disciples, so the warning that we find in this verse. So number one, let's look at this, the designation of disciples. What does Jesus give us as a designation here? Well, he says, you are the salt of the earth. Who is? You. That you is emphatic. It's literally you, only you, you and only you. No one else is able to wield the influence that God wants wielded in this earth. And so this is talking about Jesus was sitting on the side of a mountain when he preached this, and he's talking to probably multiplied thousands. Several thousands of people are gathered around, and he's teaching them. Now, some of those are going already, some of them are already true, genuine disciples. His 12, uh, at least 11 of them we know were true, genuine disciples. And then there are probably others who will become true, genuine followers of Jesus, giving their lives and their hearts over to him and losing their life for his sake and so forth. And then there are probably others who are just more or less curious listeners, uh, who are peripheral, if you will. And Jesus is specifically addressing those genuine disciples, those who are going to become his genuine followers, who are going to be the poor in spirit, and who will end up mourning over their sin, and being gentle or submitting themselves under the yoke uh, of Jesus Christ and taking on his authority for their life. He's talking about those individuals who by hungering and thirsting will continue to grow and develop the peacemaking and uh, you know, mercy and uh, pure in heart and so forth. He's talking about those individuals there. So this is who you are. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. This is who you are. This is your description. This is your character. That's who you are. And this is the lens by which we need to be also viewing ourselves. This is what Jesus says we are. I believe I am who he says I am. And that I need to be who he says I am. When I'm driving down my uh, down the road, or when you're driving down the road this week, and you're going about your business, be thinking, I'm salt. I am the salt of the earth. 
And so when you interact with that individual at the bank or at the supermarket or in your neighborhood or whoever it is that you end up talking to, you are to leave an imprint with an influence that you have. It is an influence that you have. You're the salt of the earth, and it is in keeping those beatitudes that you're able to have that influence. And so as salt, you have a purpose. You have been baptized into Christ. You have been forgiven. God doesn't just beam us up to heaven as soon as we obey the gospel. Man, that might be nice, but as soon as you come out of the baptistry, he doesn't zap you up to heaven and say, okay, I've got you with me. We're still here. He wants us to serve a purpose while we're here. He wants us to be an influencer in this world that's representing the qualities and the characteristics of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have an obligation to be diligently developing those things. And as we do, then we interact with the world. He doesn't want us to be hermits. He doesn't want us to be like monks who go off into, you know, monasteries and sort of separate ourselves out from the world and have no interaction he does want us interacting in this world. In his high priestly prayer, you remember Jesus prayed not that they would be taken out of the world, but that they would be kept from the evil one. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We've been called to be different, and we are, be, we are marching to the beat of a different drum. We are hearing the words and the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we hear him tell us, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, we are in accordance with that, marching along to those commands. Love one another. Love your enemies. You are the salt of the earth. And so we are listening to Jesus, and we have a mission. We have a purpose to fulfill. So Jesus' disciples, they are influencing the people around them. That's the idea. But what does that really look like? He doesn't describe us as the weapons of the world or as the landmines of the earth. And I say that because he doesn't want our influence to be hostile and aggressive and temperamental and rude and short and discourteous and angry and hot-tempered. That's not the influence that he's looking for, is it? That's not what it means to be the salt of the earth. That's an influence but not the influence that we are to have. That would be not having saltiness. And so here, the influence that we have, when we think about the way the world is, that world is still operating according to the fleshly mindset. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.13 that evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I wish the world could get better. But the Bible says it's getting worse. It gets worse. It goes on towards evil. We're told in that same chapter of 2 Timothy 3 that in the last days that men are going to be lovers of self, that they're going to be lovers of money and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They're after a lot of other things rather than God. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Listen to that. He says when lawlessness, what is lawlessness? 1 John 3, 4 says lawlessness is sin. When sin is on the rise and sin is getting worse and the world is getting more evil, he says when that starts happening, most people's love will grow cold. That's talking about people who had love, who were on fire for God, who were fervent and zealous. Most people's love, when the sin is on the rise, their love is going to start to grow cold. Brothers and sisters, we cannot allow our love to grow cold. No matter how evil this world gets, we cannot allow our influence to grow cold. We cannot allow our first love to be lost. We have to be fervent. We want to be hot and on fire for God. We don't want to move towards lukewarm, and we certainly don't want to be cold. Although cold, in God's mind, is better than lukewarm. We want to make sure we stay on fire for God, loving, loving others and loving our God in doing what He says. And so there's an idea behind being salt where you're changed and you're continually changing. The inner man is continually being renewed and staying on fire for God. Sometimes it gets wearisome when you look around and you think about some of the ways of the world and you think, 
What use is it? What good am I really doing? What influence am I having? We're making a difference. Although it may be one or two people in your life, that is a big thing in God's eyes. He can do much with little. Don't forget about that. We need to remember our influence. Let's turn in our Bibles and see the way Paul uses the term salt, which gives us, I think, further emphasis behind how the New Testament uses it. Colossians 4. I think it parallels the same concept Jesus is using with regard to its taste or its flavor, the influence that we have. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So what he's talking about here is a response that you're going to give in connection with something somebody else has said to you. Somebody maybe has asked you a question or somebody has you know, made a statement to you. Maybe they've not been treating you very kindly and you had some interaction like that. Whatever it is, you're going to respond to them, and in the response that you bring forth, what you're about to say to them is critical, and he says that your speech at that point needs to be always, always seasoned with grace, or with grace, as though seasoned with salt. The idea is your speech is to be gracious. When I think about the word grace, it's the idea behind unmerited favor, and so I don't deserve it. It's not something I've earned or really merited in any way, but I'm being given something favorable. I'm being given something that is a blessing, something that is beneficial and good. And if your speech is seasoned, as it were, with grace or with graciousness, then whatever you say, even when somebody's been mean or rude to you, you're giving them a blessing instead. You're not returning insult for insult. If you're answering a question, you're doing it in a very beneficial way, something that is going to be in their minds, this is attractive. I like the way you talk to me. You know, those other customers that came through here, uh, you know, maybe I wasn't very nice to them, but they sure weren't nice to me neither. But you, you're different. You're very kind to me. I'm, I know I'm having a bad day here, but you've been patient. You've been very gentle with me. You've been very kind to me. You've been very courteous and polite with me. In spite of how frustrated I may seem here, I notice something about your response. There's an influence. There's a seasoned influence that's coming forth through your speech. Maybe not just in what you're saying, but in how you're saying it. So even including your attitude, you have an influence even in this world. And that's what he's talking about here. But I want you to notice here, uh, when he talks about as seasoned with salt, this is that influence that we're talking about regarding those beatitudes, isn't it? If your speech is seasoned with salt, then your speech is seasoned with mercy. It's seasoned with gentleness. It's seasoned with peacemaking. You have that seasoning ability in what you are saying. But I want you to notice the context here in this passage. In verse 5, Paul says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. And he connects verse 6, and he brings out not only your conduct, but also your speech. What is the context of this? Well, he's talking about your interactions with who? The world. Same thing when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. It's talking about those who are out there in the world. Here he says, the outsiders. Your conduct needs to be with wisdom with outsiders. Who are the outsiders? The, these are those who are outside the body of Christ. They are outside of the covering of Jesus' blood. They are outside of the salvation. These are those who are outside of a relationship with God. They are not inside. They are not with us. They are outside. They are still under the control of Satan. They are still living in the domain of darkness and walking according to the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That's who they are. And when we're interacting with them, we need to make sure that our conduct is with wisdom. What kind of wisdom do you think he's talking about? Wisdom from below or wisdom from above? We know it's wisdom from above. Turn over to James chapter 3. What kind of wisdom or what kind of conduct does this look like? 
<clears throat> well, we know what our speech needs to be. It's seasoned with salt. It's going to be with gentleness and peacemaking and purity and so forth. But what about our conduct? What is it to look like? Well, it needs to have wisdom. Let's look at what that means. James 3, 17 and 18. Here's the wisdom that should permeate your conduct. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Wait a minute. Pure? Isn't that what the Beatitudes have? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the pure in heart is who we are. When I conduct myself with those outside, it needs to start with the purity of my heart. I'm not imbibing all of this you know, filth and putrefying influence of the world through all of the media and, and entertaining things. I've got to be careful and guard my heart from what I'm allowing in. So first and foremost, I've got to be pure. He says, then the wisdom from above is then peaceable. Wait a minute. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is what it means to be the salt of the earth. You're developing this quality of being a peacemaker. You're peaceable, as much as it depends on you, Romans 12 says. Gentle. He says, you're going to be conducting yourself with gentleness. This means you have control of your faculties. And so where so, somebody else may lose their cool and lash out and say something insulting to somebody who's insulted them, you've got complete control. And you're not going to lose control. You're going to treat them with gentleness. Reasonable, which means willing to yield. You're not unyielding. I think about traffic sometimes. There's those signs that tell you the lane ahead is going to close. And so everybody's merging into the one lane. And you get way down the road and you finally get to where that lane closes. You've been in this lane for a long time and there's that guy. You see him in your mirror. He's come flying up the side past all these cars. He didn't want to get over when the sign said to get over, right? So he's been flying past all these cars. And then at the last minute, he's trying to dip in there. Are you willing to yield? Some people just get close as they can to that guy in front of them. There ain't no way that guy's getting in here. I am not going to let him in. He didn't get over when he should have got over. He made a mistake way back yonder. I'm not willing to yield. I'm sorry. And that guy may have some choice words or a look on his face or maybe throw up a gesture. Uh, you're not letting him in and it's tense and he's trying to get up there and you're hoping he don't hit your bumper. And you could avoid all of that if you're willing to yield. He probably doesn't deserve it. Yeah, he didn't do what was right. But you know what? Tap your brakes. Let the guy over. Wave him on. You know what he did. But you're willing to yield. Even though what about as Christians? Are we willing to yield? Maybe we know that individual. Maybe it's a brother or sister in Christ. I know what you did back yonder. I know the way you acted. I know what you didn't do or you failed to do. You didn't, you didn't do what was right. Guess what? Now you're trying to find a way in. You're trying to get into a relationship with me. You want to be friends again? Guess what? I'm not willing to yield for you. Do we have this salt in ourselves? This is what Jesus wants us to have. He says, reasonable, full of mercy, or blessed are the merciful. Those who bear good fruits, they're unwavering. They're not back and forth, vacillating. These are people who are consistent. They're without hypocrisy. What you see is what you get. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the wisdom that we're conducting ourselves with outsiders. This is the salt and the influence that God wants us to have in and among this world. And so while the world grows much darker, sin rises, we don't want to lose our influence. We don't want our love to grow cold. And so we're changing all the time. This is what I think Paul has in mind with regard to our conduct. And so this is what we're to be doing. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. There's a second point I want to make here, and the second point is more of a warning to Christians who they're already wielding an influence, but there is this danger, and Jesus speaks about it. He says in the second part of this verse, he started by saying, you're the salt of the earth. We understand what that means. We are to be wielding this spiritual influence. These characteristics must be found in us. And he says here, but... If the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? 
Salt has a certain chemical compound that gives it its properties that allow it to be a seasoning agent. And scientifically speaking, if those compound agents are no longer found in those little granules, you don't, if you're sitting at your kitchen table, grab your salt shaker once it, if it's not making the food taste any different, you probably pour it in your hand and taste it. If, if it doesn't have any flavor, it's not like you can put that thing in the microwave. You don't put it in the fridge or add baking soda or do something to it to make it flavorful again. It's literally no longer useful. It's to be thrown away. You have to get different salt is the picture that we see regarding salt. So when Jesus asked this rhetorical question, they knew what he was saying. If salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And so it means that you're no longer bearing forth the Beatitudes. You're no longer operating with wisdom from above. There's no longer purity there. Now you've allowed the world's filth to start inundating your mind and heart. You've become a cesspool for filthy thinking. It means you're no longer hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You're not interested in studying the Bible much anymore. You're more interested in the world's filth and entertainment. This is not really appealing to me. And so you're no longer bearing forth characteristics like peacemaking and gentleness. Those things have long since left you. And you've got nothing left to operate with except the sharp barbs of the world. And God's not looking for that. He's looking for a few good folks. And the ones he's looking for are going to be wielding this influence. It's not just because you were baptized and you go to church that Jesus is saying, you're mine. All those things are important. He wants an influence. That's what he's looking for. There's a passage that I think makes this point. Turn to Hebrews 6. When he says, if the salt has lost its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Hebrews chapter 6 is, starts by talking about individuals who have already tasted the good word of the Lord and they've already experienced what it means to be a Christian. Those benefits and those spiritual blessings have already been theirs. They've already wielded some influence in the world. Look at verse 7 and 8. He uses a metaphor to describe it. He says, For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. And so I've got a garden, and when my garden's producing vegetables, it's useful. That's what he says here. He says, vegetation useful. So the picture of being useful to the Lord is bringing forth this vegetation. It's something that is useful for him. I've tilled that garden. If it's bringing forth vegetables, it's useful to me. It's feeding me. If it doesn't, he says in verse 8, if it yields thorns and thistles, and we've all brushed up next to a thorn or a thistle a time or two, you don't soon forget that. That's not somebody showing mercy. That's not somebody with gentleness. That's not somebody that's going to be a peacemaker. They're going to give you that sharp barbed response. And so if you're no longer bearing forth this useful vegetation, he says now you're left to bear nothing but thorns and thistles. He says it is worthless. It's useless. And it's close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. If that influence goes out of you because you're no longer wielding it, he says you're useless. God has no use for those who, even though they were baptized, they may go to church. If they're no longer bringing forth this influence in the world, useless. This is what he's looking for. This is what he wants in each one of us. This is so critical that we grasp a hold of this. And so if we don't have it, we become useless. Jesus says that it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. No longer good for anything. You know, I've heard some insults in my day. And I've had people insult me before. I don't think anybody's ever called me a good for nothing. I don't think I've ever had anybody, although if somebody close to me, it probably sting quite a bit. 
If they said, you know what, you're good for nothing. You're not good for anything. You're useless. Well, that would sting. But I'd get over it. I'm pretty sure I'd get over it. I wouldn't let it ruin my whole week. I might dwell on it for a day or two. But you know what? If Jesus said that to me, if Jesus said to me, Stephen Hill, you are useless to me. That would ruin my entire life. Wouldn't it yours? That would ruin my entire life. I wouldn't be able to sleep. I wouldn't be able to function. I'd be terrified if he said that to me. I'm useless, not good for anything, because you don't have salt in you anymore. The only thing you're good for is to be thrown out. Lord, I don't even know what I'd say. I don't want to be useless to the Lord. And yet that's what he says in Matthew 5, 21, the warning, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit murder. But he says, if you say to your brother, you good for nothing, you'd be guilty enough to go before the court. And if you go on to say, you fool, you'd be guilty enough to go to the fiery hell. We dare not tell anybody they're good for nothing. That passage makes that clear. But if the Lord says it, he speaks the truth. I think about the passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And in that passage, we're told that we have to add to our faith. It's by faith that we've been able to access all of the spiritual blessings of God and have this new life. But he says that we have to apply all diligence so that we can add things to our faith. So we're not done once we become a Christian. We've really just begun. And now we're adding to our faith, the very faith that got us in in the first place, God's grace plus our faith, we got in, and now there's an obligation to be adding to our faith. And that means applying all diligence. And he says they're adding things like moral excellence, uh, knowledge, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. He mentions love. There's a sevenfold list. And then in verse 8, he says, If these qualities are yours and are increasing, it's not enough that I've got them. I've got to be growing in them. If they're yours and they're increasing, he says, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he use negative terminology there? Why doesn't he say, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you both useful and fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? Why does he say useless and unfruitful? I think it's because he wants to emphasize the danger and the warning of this actually happening to somebody. You can become useless and no longer bearing forth this characteristics that is the influence that God wants wielded by Christians in this world. And if we're back in Hebrews chapter 6, the only way this happens is because we're no longer applying all diligence. How long do I have to apply diligence to Bible study, to meditating on the Word of God, to reading and studying this? How long does that have to go on in my life? When you become a Christian, you sign up to become a full-time, lifelong student of God's Word. And this is your daily bread. You're just going to eat this like you eat food every day. There needs to be a portion that you're ingesting. And so in Hebrews 6, when he says, if it yields thorns and thistles, that ground that was tilled was supposed to bring forth useful vegetation, but now it's bringing forth thorns and thistles. He says it's close to being cursed. It ends up being burned. Down in verse 11, he says, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. The same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. How long do I have to show the same diligence? Until the end. How can I be faithful until death? I've got to continue diligently putting myself into the Word and putting the Word into myself so that it may dwell in me richly. In verse 12, he says, so that you will not be sluggish. How is it going to end up that I stop bearing these qualities, that I stop bearing fruit, that I lose my saltiness, that I'm no longer good for anything when I become sluggish, when I become like a sluggard, when I become somebody who's no longer diligently applying myself to the Word of God. What happens is I start neglecting the Word of God. I neglect spending time reading it. I neglect spending time studying it. I neglect spending time with God in meditation over what he said to me, his son. 
and I'm no longer hearing his voice. I'm hearing only the world around me. And then I will end up compromising, receiving those promises that he has given, an inheritance that he has promised. And so here the inception that he gives is, if you are no longer salty, there's only one exception. You're not good for anything except this, to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7, do not give what is holy to dogs or throw your pearls before swine. This is an interesting picture. Otherwise, he says that stuff will be trampled underfoot. Can you imagine, why would pigs, why would they trample such nice pearls? I mean, these are real high quality pearls. We're talking about good money. This stuff is worth something. These are beautiful. What in the world would the pig do? Why is it trampling those things? Because it's useless to it. Only thing that pig cares about is a warm bucket of slop and a warm puddle of mud. <laughs> and if it isn't that, it doesn't want it. It'll walk right across the top of those valuable pearls. We're useless to God if we're not bearing forth fruit. And he says we're to be thrown out. When you see this picture in your mind of being thrown out by God, I picture this parable that he told in Matthew 22 where a king was having a wedding feast for his son who was getting married. And so he invited everybody in his kingdom. Some of the more distinguished individuals, and many of them spurned the invitation. So he continued inviting. He says he's you know, slaughtered his livestock, everything's ready, come to the feast. So they go out and they invite people in the highways and the byways and everywhere you can find people, come in, both good and evil. And it says in the parable that the dinner hall was filled with dinner guests. It was filled. And then it says the king came in to look over his dinner guests. And he says that there was a man in there. The only prerequisite for coming to this dinner was you had to don or put on a wedding garment, which we understand is the character of Christ. We're putting on the new self and taking off the old, right? We've got to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, these very same qualities, Colossians 3.12 and following. We're putting on the new self. We're putting on these characteristics by continued applied diligence. And so we're adding to our faith. But the king comes in, he looks over his dinner guests, and he says there was a man in there who was not wearing a wedding garment. In other words, this is a man who's not bearing salt. He's not salty. He's not bringing forth vegetation. He walked up to the man and he says, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And it said that that man was speechless. The man had nothing to say at that point. The king said, Bind him hand and foot and throw him out. You're not good for anything. You're useless to me except to be thrown out. He says, throw him out into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it says, many are called, but few are chosen. God sends out his gospel invitation to many, and many will obey the gospel and try to come to the feast. But are we putting on that garment? Are we bearing forth that fruit? Are we manifesting that salt-like influence in this world. If we lose our saltiness, how can we be made salty again? We need to ask ourselves this question this morning. Are we still salty? Are we still useful to God as the salt of the earth? Are you putting forth that influence that He wants in this world? God's looking for specific type of people. He's not just looking for anybody. He's not just wanting heaven to be filled. He's going to fill heaven according to His standards. And He's looking for people who will put that diligence in until the end, who will not allow their love to grow cold or their light to go out. Is it you? You know, unfortunately, with salt, there's an impossibility to restore those chemical compounds once that saltiness is gone. But what's impossible with salt is possible with God. If you're no longer bearing forth the influence of Christ, God can raise people from the dead and spiritually He can do that for you. But it's going to take following the same procedure. You have to be poor in spirit. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to 
mourn over your sin. Be with a broken and contrite heart. If your heart is so hardened and you're callous to where you're no longer going to mourn over your sin, you're no longer willing to budge, you're not going to change, I pray that's not your heart this morning. If you have a need to repent and your heart is broken and contrite, you can come and put yourself at the mercy of God and His heart will be touched by that. And the Scriptures back it up. He will forgive you and give you an opportunity to start again. If you need access to God's grace and His mercy today, you're a step away and a broken and contrite heart away from receiving it. If you have any need, whether it's to obey the gospel or ask forgiveness of sins or be restored as the prodigal son was, we ask you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.